Okay, this is Physics 1A for Wednesday, May 26th, and uh, today we're going to be covering these topics up here. We're going to talk about geosynchronous satellites and just satellites in general, and then we're going to discuss gravitational potential energy, and we're going to use this to look at problems that involve uh, orbits. So let's briefly refresh what we did last time and then get right into it. Okay, so last time we talked about Kepler's laws and Newton's universal gravity, right? And Kepler's laws, just to remind you, because we're gonna we're gonna derive, I guess at least one of these today. Um, they are that uh, planets, and this refers to really anything, uh, orbit in ellipses, not circles. Circular orbits are a special case. The first thing that we're gonna talk about today, a geosynchronous orbit. Will this session be recorded? Um, it's currently being recorded. Yes. I believe everything that we've done has been recorded as far as I know. Uh, okay, planets orbit in ellipses. Uh, the second uh, law, which states that uh, a line drawn from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas and equal times, we figured out that that pretty much means that planets travel quickly when they're close to an object like the sun, they travel slowly when they're far, far enough away, and ultimately what that can be summarized is, is that angular momentum is conserved in orbits. And the third one was that the semi-major axis cubed for an orbit is proportional to the period squared. And this is the one that we're going to prove first today. Okay. The other thing that we learned about was Newtonian gravitation. And Newtonian gravitation is the idea that if I have two objects, a mass m1, another mass m2, and they're separated by some distance between them that we call r, that there are going to be attractive forces between these objects like this. And we call that attractive force the force of gravity, and it has the it's equal to g times m1 times m2, so the product of their masses, divided by the distance between them squared, and uh, the quantity g is a sometimes called the universal gravitational constant, sometimes it's called Newton's constant, uh, and uh, it looks like this. So those are all the things that we learned last time about how gravity works. And now we're going to start to apply these ideas to uh, things that are orbiting. And the first one we're going to talk about is a geosynchronous satellite. So a geosynchronous satellite is a satellite that orbits the Earth. And it does so at a um, constant altitude. And it stays above the same point uh, on the on the surface of the Earth. So it's synchronized with the rotation of our planet geo for earth right so geosynchronous means that the uh, the object uh, orbits um i'll say it's like this it's in orbit and orbit where the satellite is always above the same point. Oops. Okay. And we're going to look at a geosynchronous satellite that's orbiting about the equator. So um, let's draw a picture of this. So we start off with like a little small circle for the Earth. We'll make it green or something. And then we're going to have a circle for our orbit, which is going to be around that. Try to make it a circle. I'll try to put it right at the center of this. OK, so here's the Earth. And here is our path for our satellite. So on this path, we're going to have a satellite right here. So we'll just draw a little picture of a satellite with these little solar panels. Uh, the satellite is going to have a mass m. The other important quantities we're going to need to know for this problem are going to be the mass of the Earth, which uh, I think we actually calculated this last time to be about 6 times 10 to the 24. Okay, something's wrong with the way this thing is positioned because this is not, not writing how I would expect. Kilograms. Um, we're also going to need to know the radius of the Earth. No, are we going to need to know that? We are, because we're looking for altitude. Uh, altitude means above the surface of the planet. The radius of the Earth is about 
times 10 to the 6th meters, or 6,400 kilometers. Oh, I don't know what's wrong today. I'm just like sitting in the wrong position or something, but I can't, can't seem to write legibly. I just kind of reposition myself. Um, I think that's all we need to know. And what we're going to calculate here is the radius or the altitude of the satellite. So I'm going to draw a line right here out to where the object is. And we'll just fix it since OneNote doesn't like to do that with the make it a different color. We'll say that this is R. So we're looking for the altitude of this satellite. okay? And uh, we're going to say that this satellite is moving kind of along the equatorial plane of the Earth, which means if you were to take the Earth and cut a slice through the equator, uh, this plane would pass through that, or that plane, plane would pass through this orbit here. Um, okay, so we have a satellite. It is orbiting above the Earth, and it is orbiting in such a way that as it goes around, it always stays above the same location on Earth. So let's say if this is like, um, so if we're on the equator, I have to fig figure out some, something that's near the equator. I think Ecuador is near the equator. So if the, if the satellite is like right above Ecuador, then uh, it's going to stay directly above it all the time. And I guess I would ask, uh, before we even go through this, why would you want to have a satellite that would do something like this? We have a lot of satellites in this particular orbit. Why would you want to have a satellite that would stay directly over one point? Any ideas? What would be some of the advantages of that? I could think of a couple. Possibly a major city there. Just... Uh you know, maybe transfers frequencies to another station, possibly. Okay, so the, the, this this satellite could service a city, is what you're saying? Sure. It could be yes. like a, a communication satellite that services like local TV stations and maybe internet companies and stuff like that. And maybe it could be used, you're saying, to, to, to communicate with another satellite that maybe is over here on the other side of the planet or something like that. Yes, That's possible. Exactly. Okay. What else could you use it for? Yeah, so, so he's saying basically this satellite could be dedicated to serving one city or something like that. Yeah, military uses, like when you just, I mean, any satellite could be used for military purposes. What do you mean in particular, Haiti? What, what's what's a military purpose you could have for this? Satellite imaging over a small area, maybe? Yeah, sure. If you wanted to track, yeah, exactly. If you wanted to track, like, yeah, take, take pictures of military bases and stuff like that. Yeah, spying on people. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of pretty obvious uses for something like this, right? Okay, now let's talk about orbits. So <clears throat> an orbit is a situation where you have an object and it is going around in a pattern. In this particular case, we're going to have a circular orbit. And in a circular orbit, what you have going on is you have this object, the satellite, and it has some speed, um, right? And it's going to have like a tangential velocity that's going to point, for example, like this. Uh, this this velocity is just gonna, we're going to call it v, but it's a tangential velocity vector. Now the idea here, this goes back to what we talked about with Newton earlier, is that if the satellite moves fast enough, then it will constantly move in a circular path, um, even though Earth's gravity is pulling on it. There's a gravitational force that pulls on this object that points directly towards the center of the Earth, like this, along this radius right here. That's the direction of the force of gravity on this object. We'll just label that as a force. And I should make this one a vector too. So we have a situation where we have a velocity vector this way and a force vector that is uh, perpendicular to it. So we have a situation that's consistent with um, what we called earlier centripetal acceleration, right? Or radial acceleration. So when you have an object that's traveling in a circular path like that, we know that it's going to have an acceleration uh, that's equal to v squared, its velocity squared, divided by the radius of the path that it travels on. And that can work as long as you have some kind of a central force, a force that points towards the center, which we do in this case, the force of gravity. Now imagine the satellite sitting in space. It feels the force of gravity from the Earth. Can you imagine any other forces this satellite might feel as it travels through space? Is there going to be any friction? No. Could there be friction? I think you're right. There's probably not going to be much, but could there be friction? Possibly. Where, maybe, um, where would it come from? Debris. Well, let's say just a space debris. Sure. It, it, it's, con it's conceivable that there's a bunch of space debris up there that it could interact with. What other places could friction maybe come from? What about the Earth's atmosphere? Could that provide friction? Or drag, for that matter? 
Yeah, if it's low enough, right? If it's low enough, sure. So I guess it depends ultimately on what the altitude we get here is, whether or not uh, it's going to interact with the Earth's atmosphere. But it's definitely the case that if the satellite in any way can can touch even a portion of the Earth's atmosphere, then it's going to lose energy. Um, so I, there's, a, there's a question on one of the walls of one of the physics streams at the school, and the question is, satellites, how do they stay up there? And the answer okay. is that satellites tend to basically, you know, once this satellite has some velocity and it's only subject to this one force and there's no friction, right? It should technically just, I mean, according to the laws of motion that we've learned in this class, right? If we can say the friction is non-existent, then it's going to keep going in this path forever, right? It doesn't even need propulsion, right? Like an airplane, it needs propulsion to keep flying, right? And if it runs out of fuel, it's, it, it can glide maybe, but it's just going to glide toward the ground. It can't stay up in the air. Um, yeah, in a very real way, the satellite is in free fall. It's constantly in free fall. Does that make sense? It's constantly falling towards the Earth, but it also has this speed, so it never actually falls in. You know, satellites don't spiral inwards. They basically just stay at, at, at their altitudes all the time. It's one of the really kind of powerful things about putting something into orbit um, is, uh, yeah, basically it will just stay up there. Sometimes you have to, they have to do minor course corrections if it gets off of its orbit somehow due to... I mean, there's technically other things that could alter the orbit of this object. What other things in space are there that could maybe alter the orbit of this object right here? Are there any other gravitational sources that could create a force on this? I was thinking maybe the moon. The moon, sure, the moon exerts, so let's say the moon is over here at some point in time. It's going to pull this way on it, right? And even if the moon doesn't affect it, maybe the sun will affect it, or maybe Jupiter will affect it, right? So there's ways in which different things in, in space could tug on our satellite here. But when it's close enough to the surface of the Earth, we can usually neglect those things. And if for some reason our satellites uh, lose a little bit of altitude, we can always go and correct it. Because most satellites carry with them some small amount of uh, propellant that they can use to, to kind of fix their, uh, their orbits whenever they need to. Okay. Um, and the way that a satellite can give itself propulsion, by the way... We never talked about this in this class, is by using uh, conservation momentum. It fires like gas off in this direction, which makes it move in the other direction, basically, when it needs to alter its orbit. So if it needs to raise its orbit, it can maybe shoot gas this way, which would make it fly up that way, right? So is Earth's atmosphere that thick that it could cause friction? Absolutely. It definitely can. One thing I can say about this is uh, when we first sent people into space, uh, doing the first, like, orbits around the Earth and stuff like that with rockets. Um, the first person that we sent up into orbit... Okay, I don't remember who it is now. I think it's, like, Alan Shepard, or maybe it was Glenn. I'm not sure. Um, the first uh, astronauts that we sent into space, when we put them into orbit, um, you know, they only had enough energy to get into the orbit in their in their rocket tanks. So they, they managed to get into, like, a low Earth orbit altitude, or low altitude... Uh, Earth orbit, and then the way that they returned to Earth was they basically just used the drag of the Earth's atmosphere, and that basically just slowly brought them down. And I think the first people that we sent up, they went on like seven trips around the Earth before they actually um, fell out of orbit and you know opened their parachutes and crashed into the ocean. So yeah, the Earth's atmosphere definitely causes friction. This is something that's commonly seen if you watch. Um, if you watch re-entry for any kind of vessel that's returning to Earth, or if you like watch a movie where when uh, something's returning to Earth from outer space, you always see that the, when it hits the Earth's atmosphere, there's like a red trail of like heat or whatever and energy and interaction with the atmosphere. So, so yeah, the Earth's atmosphere definitely is thick enough to cause friction. And when you're talking about something that doesn't have propulsion, like this, even a tiny amount of friction will work, work on it over time to cause it to lose energy. And when it loses enough velocity, then it's going to kind of spiral in towards the Earth. All right, so we know that this uh, satellite has a centripetal acceleration that's equal to this. And we can use Newton's uh, second law to say that the net force that acts along the radial direction should be equal to the mass of the object times that centripetal acceleration. There's only one force in this case, which is the force of gravity. And so that force should be equal to mv squared over r. We also know what the force of gravity is. It's equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of our satellite times the mass of the planet. 
divided by uh, the distance squared uh, from the center of the Earth out to where the object is. And now what we could do is we could try to solve for what R is. But even if we know, even if I gave you a mass for the satellite, it wouldn't really matter because you can see right here that the mass of the satellite actually cancels out, which is quite, quite nice. Um, so even if we know G, M, E, we kind of have two unknowns here, which are velocity and radius. And we're trying to find basically what this is equal to. We want to know what this is because we're trying to find altitude. So if we knew the, the radius, the distance from the center of the Earth out to the object, we could find the altitude by just finding the distance from the planet to the object. But in order to do that, we need to know something about the velocity of the object. And whether it's obvious or not here, uh, we can actually say something about the velocity. Maybe not specifically about the velocity, but about how long it takes for the satellite to go around one time. So a geosynchronous satellite is an orbit where the satellite is always above the same location. It's always above the same location. And again, we said this is supposed to be a satellite that's above uh, the equator, right? Now, the Earth is rotating, right? The Earth rotates on its axis, and it takes 24 hours for it to rotate one time around the axis, right? So that means that this satellite, in order to stay directly above the same location, how long should it take to make one trip around? They meant the Earth's rotation, so 24 hours. 24 hours, exactly. So if this satellite takes exactly 24 hours to get back to this location, then the Earth will have spun underneath it exactly 24. Uh, sorry, will have spun, spun exactly one rotation by that point. Exactly. So we know then that the period of our satellite, T, has to be equal to 24 hours. And we can connect that to the velocity because... If I have a path where I'm moving with a constant velocity and I go around like this and I know the radius of the path, then the distance that I've traveled is 2 pi r and the time that it took was 24 hours. That means that our velocity in this case is going to be equal to 2 pi times the radius of the path divided by the period. And we can plug that into our equation right here. Let's do some things real quick here. First of all, let's cancel this radius with this one. And uh, then let's plug some things in. So we have g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth on the left-hand side. We have on the right-hand side really just v squared, which is now going to be this. So we're going to plug in 2 pi r divided by the period. And we're going to square that. And then we're going to solve for r now, because now we know all the other variables here. So um, what we end up getting uh, is, let's go this way. So we have um, g m e over r equals, the right-hand side becomes 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. I'm now going to rearrange this just really quickly here. So that it's going to say t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g times the mass of the earth. All of this is a constant. And this is multiplied by r cubed. So this equation is Kepler's third law. It says that, it's kind of backwards from the way I wrote it up here. It says that the semi-major axis cubed, in the case of a circle, the semi-major axis is the same thing as the radius, right? Just to remind you, the semi-major axis, if you have an ellipse, you cut the ellipse in half this way, and you cut the ellipse half this way, A is the semi-major axis, B is the semi-minor axis. If you do the same thing for a circle, then A is just the radius, right? So r cubed is proportional to t squared, and this is the proportionality constant. And it is a constant. It's just 4 pi times over g times the mass of whatever the body at the center is. So we basically just proved um, Newton's third law. Or, sorry, Kepler's third law, which is one of the things to remind you what we did last time that Newton was trying to do. One of the things he was trying to do was to prove that Kepler's laws were correct. And we just proved one of them. And what did we do to prove it? Well, we just used Newton's laws, right? We used this one, and then we used Newton's law of gravitation. So Newton was able to actually prove all of Kepler's laws. Now our goal here was to find r. So let's calculate what r is equal to. 
So in our equation here, then r is going to be equal to, um, it's pi squared, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he's, he's right about that. Let me put that in a different color so it's clear that I made a mistake there. Thank you. Yeah, it was pi squared right there. It should be pi squared right here as well. Thank you. All right, so r in this case then is going to be equal to uh, g m e over 4 pi squared t squared, and then all of this has to be raised to the 1 third power. So, putting everything in, we're going to get And we need to convert 24 hours into seconds. And I think it's uh, so 3,600 times 24. I think it's 86,400 seconds. Is that right? If you multiply 24 by 3,600. Yeah. So that's what we have to plug in for time for the, the period. Square that, and then all of this has to be raised to the one third power. <laughs> Three hundred. So all that's going to give us R, which we'll put the answer over here. Can you all calculate that? Tell me what you get. Should be something times 10 to the 7. Did you take the cube root? Take the, you have to take the cube root of that, Alicia. But that is correct. That's what I got before I, well, close to what I got before I took the cube root. While you all are doing that, let's check the units. So we have, as far as units go, there is a Newton, which is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. There is a, we're dividing that by, oh, times meters squared. We're dividing that by kilogram squared. We're multiplying that by a kilogram. And we're multiplying that by seconds squared. And I'm pretty sure that this all is, and then the whole thing to the one third power, right? And I'm pretty sure this gives you meters because you have the second squared cancel out with second squared, all the kilograms cancel, you have with meters cubed to the one third power, so you do get meters, which is good. Okay, come on, it can't be that hard. What's the, someone else put an answer in there, please. No, that's right. 4.23 times 10 to the 7. That's the right answer. Now, this isn't technically the answer. you got to be careful about this when you look at these type of problems. You'll see this show up on your homework, too. When it says altitude, you have to take this number, right? And you need to subtract this. So I'm going to call the altitude h and just say that the altitude is equal to r minus the radius of the Earth. So if I take... 4.23 times 10 to the 7, and I subtract 6.4 times 10 to the 6th. 
then you're going to get uh, 3.6, let's just call it 3.6, 3.6 times 10 to the 7 meters, or you could write it in another way if you wanted to, a way that might be a little bit more understandable, which would be 36,000 kilometers. That is really high above the surface of the Earth if you think about it. The radius of the Earth, by comparison, is 6,400 kilometers. This is 36,000 kilometers, which is a little less, maybe about five times as high above the surface of the Earth as the radius of the Earth. So you're way up there. So going back to one of the things that we talked about, do you think that the Earth's atmosphere is going to have any effect on this object that far away? It's probably not, right? There's probably a little bit of atmosphere at that, at al at that altitude, but very, 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 very little. Now, we have a ton of satellites right at that orbit, actually. In fact, if you, if you look at all the satellites in space, there's just an absurdly large number of them, especially at this orbit. It's becoming, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in space. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a, uh, it's like a real estate issue. Now, the good thing is that space is incredibly vast, and there's, there's all kinds of places to, uh, to put satellites. I kind of want to show you all something. I should have prepared this before class, but I don't think it should be too hard for me to find it. Um, I, there's like a nice animation of all of the... Let me just do this. I'll do this. Let me see if I can find this real quick. Does anyone have any questions about this problem while I'm looking for this, though? Any questions at all? Going back to velocity, could you explain 2 pi over t? Yeah, no problem. So, an object that travels in a circular path um, can have a constant velocity, right? We learned that uh, quite a while ago, that if you have an object that's traveling in a circle, it has a constant speed, and it has a, a, a centripetal acceleration. When an object has a velocity v, and it travels along a path that has a length 2 pi r, then the velocity is just equal to the distance traveled divided by the time, and the distance traveled by our satellite is 2 pi r. And the time that it takes to go around that distance is the period, or the time that it takes the Earth to rotate around once because we want this satellite to be always above the same point on Earth. Does that make sense? Professor, quick question. Yeah. Um, just to rephrase, I think what you said is that uh, when an object goes in a circle, it will have an acceleration of v squared over r. Was that closely related to what you just said earlier? If it has a constant velocity, it will have an acceleration of v squared over r. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Okay. All right, I found some things, but I didn't find the one I was looking for. All right, so next topic is gravitational potential energy. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about um, how we calculate energy with gravity. So let's say that we have some massive object right here. Maybe it's the sun, it doesn't really matter. We have an object that has a mass of capital M, okay? And I'm gonna take a vessel, like let's say a spaceship, and we're gonna have this spaceship move in a straight line. It doesn't have to move in a straight line for this to work, but it's the easiest way to do the calculation. We're gonna say we have an object that starts off at some distance away from the Earth here that we call our initial. And it's going to move from this position to some other position in a straight line. And we're going to define the position that it moves to to be our final. We're going to say that our satellite or our object or our shuttle or whatever this is has a mass of M. Let's say that it's a shuttle and we're trying to move our shuttle uh, away from this, uh, this planet here or this sun or whatever. 
So we have this object is moving in this direction. And what we want to calculate is what is the work done by gravity? Because we know that if I calculate the work done by gravity, that should be equal to the negative of the change in potential energy due to gravity. This is one of our kind of fundamental equations in physics that have, of how work and energy are related to each other. Okay, in order to do this, all we have to do is we just need to kind of think about the forces that are acting on this object. So there's gonna be a gravitational force that pulls on this object here. Um, it's gonna pull straight, straight towards the center of the object. There's also gonna be a gravitational force on the object when it gets to this point right here. And, um, you know, we call this Fg. That's the size of the gravitational force acting on the object. And again, we know what that's equal to. The size of the gravitational force is g times m times m times, or divided by the distance between them squared. Now, in order to calculate work, there's two different ways we learned of how to calculate work, right? The two ways are you take force times distance when you have a constant force. And when you have a non-constant force, then you have to take the work done by gravity as an integral of the force dot product with its displacement. In this case, is this force going to be constant or non-constant as the object moves from this location to this location? Can you repeat when should we use both if one's constant and one's not? Well, I mean, you're supposed to already know that yourself, by the way. Uh, we're pretty far into this course. Um, you use this one when it's not constant, though, I'll just say that. So the question is, regard, that wasn't my question anyway. My question is, is the force of gravity, if I, take a, if I take a shuttle and I move my shuttle from this point to this point, so I'm moving it away from this planet, is the force of gravity on this object constant or is it not constant? Not constant. Not constant, because the radius is changing, right? Even if g, m, and m are constant, the radius is changing. So because the radius is changing, we need to use this definition for calculating the work done by gravity. All right, so work done by gravity then is gonna be force of gravity, we plug that in, um, and that's gonna be uh, oops, g times little m times big M divided by r squared. Now we're dot producting that with our displacement. The displacement is gonna be like this. This is our displacement vector. So these two are technically in opposite directions to each other. So I think you have to put a negative sign on here. Although something tells me you don't, I don't know. But I think it's gonna become something like this. And we're gonna be integrating from R initial to R final. And so let's do that. The negative sign here is because dr points this way and fg points back this way. It's just one thing I worry about is um, I think it's going to work out. I just I, sometimes I get a little confused with these negative signs. Okay, uh, we're doing this integration. Um, G, M, and M can all be pulled out. What's this integral going to be? The integral of one over r squared dr. One over three r cubed. Hold on a second. Yeah, negative one over three r cubed. No. Negative one over r. When you have a function f of r that's equal to r to the negative two and you want to take the antiderivative of this, you right. have to add one to the power. So you go r to the negative two, you add one to the power, and then you take your new power, which is going to be negative one, and you multiply that down in the front. I, technically, you divide by the new power, right? It's just it doesn't matter because it's negative one. So this gives us negative r to the negative one, which is equal to negative one over r. OK, so this is negative one over r. And that is, uh, we're going to have to integrate that from r initial to r final. It's r initial. Okay, the two negative signs cancel out, and we end up getting g m m multiplied by 1 over r final minus 1 over r initial. 
So this calculates the work done by gravity. Now the first question is with this right here is, is this positive, negative, or um, for the case where the object starts closer to the planet and it moves farther away from the planet, okay, so it's moving away from the planet, is the work done by gravity positive or negative in this case? It's positive. What if we pick some numbers? What if we pick some numbers? What if what if this is one over ten to the eight minus one over ten to the seven? All right, man, that's stupid. Let's let's not make it complicated. There's no reason to make it complicated. What if it's one over ten minus one over eight? Is that positive or negative? I would get negative. It's negative, right? Because one eighth is bigger than a tenth, right? Okay, so in this case, the work done by gravity would be negative. Let me ask another question, because I want to compare this to something you already understand. I take a pen, okay? It does not depend on the distance traveled. No, it does not depend on the distance traveled. The quantity does. Whether it's positive or negative depends on whether it's going toward or away from the planet, okay? In this case, what's going on? The object is traveling away from the planet, and we just said in this particular case that the work done by gravity is less than zero, right? Let's compare that to throwing an object on the surface of the Earth, because it's exactly the same concept. I take a pen. Let's take a pen that you can maybe see. And I take it and I throw it upwards, and we think about what happens up until the point when it reaches its, its uh, apex. Is the work done by gravity when it's on the way up, okay, when the pin goes upwards, is the work done by gravity positive or negative when you move away from the surface? Go in this way. Negative in that case. It's negative. In both cases. Both cases, right? Not just in that case. In both cases, it's negative, right? So can you, can you all see how it's the exact same idea? You have an object that's very far away from the surface of a planet, right? And it moves away from the surface of the planet in outer space, right? Work done by gravity, negative. Because gravity wants to pull it in, and it's going away, right? You take an object near the surface of the Earth, you throw it up. While it's on the way up, the work done by gravity is also negative, right? Because gravity's pulling down, and it's going up. Okay. So... Can you all see how these are basically the exact same situation? They are the same situation. What do you mean? They're not, they're not basically. They are the same. Throwing an object up this way versus an object that's moving really far away from the center of the Earth. Can you all see how it's like mechanically the same thing is going on in terms of energy and work? Does anyone have any questions about that before we keep going? Okay. I get the impression a lot of you are still confused, but if you don't want to ask or you don't want to even answer a question, it is what it is. All right, so we have to, the work done by gravity is going to be equal to the negative of the change of potential energy. So this is equal to the negative of the change in potential energy due to gravity. And our goal here is to define what potential energy is. So what we have to do now is we have to write the change of potential energy as, let me move this up a little bit so we have a little bit more room, negative of the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. That's what that expression negative delta UG means. And all of this is equal to, I'm going to expand this out. So this is going to be written as GMM over R final minus GMM over R initial. And now what we do is we look at the left side and we look at the right side. And I think what I'll do is I'm going to move the, I'm going to multiply both sides times the negative. So I'm going to move the negative to the left hand side like this. And then what we can do is we can kind of look at these two expressions and say, u final, right, has to correspond to this term, right? And u initial has to correspond to this term right here. So what that means is that in general, the definition of the potential energy due to gravity when you get outside of, when you get off the surface of a planet, basically, is going to be equal to g times little m times big m so the mass of the object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance between their centers and we have a negative sign that we need to put on here as well so this is the definition of the potential energy due to gravity this is the definition that we're going to use when we have objects that are outside of kind of like the normal gravitational influence of the planet once you get above the place where gravity is just constant, basically. 
where gravity starts to kind of fall off and get weaker. Now we can plot this function near the surface of the Earth, and it will look something like this. So if this is the Earth, or any object that has a mass m, try to make it circular. OK. So let's say that this is a planet. Like, I guess we could say it's Earth. So here's Earth. And let's say that this represents the radius of the Earth. And I'm going to plot on this system. I'm going to plot the potential energy due to gravity as a function of radius. So we're basically going to plot this function right here. Um, so we have Earth right here. We have the radius of the Earth right here. And we're only going to start this calculation at the surface of the planet. So let me drop another line right here to represent the surface of the planet. Oops, didn't mean to make that long. Okay. And for this function, if I were to draw this function, it would basically look something like this. Would you all agree? It's basically just negative one over R, which if you want to plot that in your calculator, plug in y equal to negative one over x, and you're going to get at least this portion of the curve. You'd also have a portion of the curve up here, right? But we're not going to worry about that. We're just looking at it in the, to, to the right with, with uh, basically with the idea that r only increases, okay? We can't really have negative r. It's not really going to be too meaningful in this particular case. Okay. Um, so at this point right here, when you are right at the surface of the planet, the potential energy is going to be negative g m m over the radius of the planet, and then it'll get less and less and less negative as you go farther and farther away. What's the value of the potential energy as we go off to infinity, as the radius increases to infinity? What happens to the potential energy? It goes to zero. Does that make sense? The idea would be that when you're really far away from an object, it doesn't exert any influence on you. That's what potential energy is, right? Potential energy is the idea that there is a potential for something to move, right? Um, I can hold an object um, at some location above the surface of the Earth. It has potential energy, but it won't move until I let it go, right? So if you have an object that's infinitely far away from the Earth, the Earth isn't going to exert really any gravity on it. That's what that means. Um, and it's negative. What does it mean that it's negative? The fact that it's negative means that it's a binding energy. And a binding energy is the type of energy that, well, it does what it says. It binds objects together. So you could say that the Earth and Moon, they're bound together, right? And if you wanted to, you could calculate the potential energy of the Earth-Moon system, right? All you'd have to do is plug in the mass of the Moon, the mass of the Earth, and the distance between the Earth and the Moon. And you would get a negative value. That means that the Earth and the Moon have a negative energy of gravity. Right? And what that means is that, let's say that the quantity was negative 10 billion joules. Okay? Let's say that we, got, we calculated the energy between the Earth and the Moon, and we got negative 10 billion joules. I think you'd probably get an even bigger number than that, but it doesn't really matter. What that means is that you'd have to put, you'd have to give the Moon 10 billion joules of energy, kinetic energy, in order to have it escape from the Earth's gravitational influence. That's what we mean by binding energy. You'd have to put energy in to rip it away from the the gravitational influence of the Earth, right? Gravitational systems are bound, and the energy we just used, that used to describe them is negative. Have you all ever seen negative energy show up in your chemistry classes? Just depends on how much chemistry you've taken, I guess. Have you have you all you guys have seen anything in chemistry that involves negative energy like this? Anyone here even taking chemistry? Certainly some of you are, right? What I'm thinking of in particular is uh, um, the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, the, the, the energies of the electrons. Does that sound familiar to you all? 
like electrons that go between energy levels and when they do so they release like they release light in the form of like you know photons that have certain specific wavelengths anyone studied that yet maybe not maybe this is something you're going to study later i would think it's something you possibly would have studied in high school but you may not have taken uh, ah so andrew okay you have studied right so the same thing happens inside of the hydrogen atom the energy of the electrons is negative the lowest energy level of the hydrogen atom is negative 13.6 electron volts and then as you go up and up and up uh it just becomes less and less negative right okay so here's another question let me pick two points here let me pick two points here let's say that we have two different objects and one of them is located at this location here and one of them is located at this location here okay so we have object one and we have object two maybe it's two different satellites that are orbiting the earth which one of them is going to have a larger potential energy one but it's more negative isn't it isn't uh isn't two gonna have a bigger energy because it's uh it's less negative You know what I mean? I mean, I could say the following statement is true, right? Negative three is greater than negative five. Is that true? That's true, right? So this object too would, would technically have, I mean, I, it's really, um, I, I understand what you're saying, Andrew, when you're closer, the quantity, the size, the magnitude of the energy would be the same, right? Or be larger here because you're closer, but this one actually has more energy which is kind of weird, right? I just want to kind of emphasize some of the weirdness of the negative sign, okay? But it is, you, you need to include this negative sign, it's important. All right, now that we know what the gravitational potential energy definition is, I have another problem we want to do. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, in Jules Verne's 1865 story with this title, From the Earth to the Moon, three men went to the moon in a shell fired from a gigantic cannon sunk in the earth in Florida. We want to find the minimum muzzle speed needed to shoot a shell straight up to a height above the earth equal to the earth's radius. We want to find the minimum muzzle speed that would allow a shell to escape from the earth completely, which is called the escape speed. We're going to neglect air resistance. We're going to neglect the earth's rotation. We're also going to neglect the gravitational pull of the moon. Um, and we're just going to figure out, um, yeah, we're not doing anything with the moon, actually. They're just using that to set up the problem. It basically just says, find the minimum muzzle speed for this cannon needed to shoot a shell straight up to a height above the earth equal to the earth's radius. All right, let's draw a picture. Um, yeah, we'll draw it down here. So here's the earth. We're going to fire a cannon right here. And our cannon is going to launch. We'll just say it's launching just an object. I guess I could launch a shuttle. Um, and it's going to be launched right here with some speed, which I'm going to call V naught. And this is what we want to calculate. It says, find the minimum muzzle speed needed to shoot a shell straight up to a height above the Earth equal to the Earth's radius. So what we want to do is say, OK, here's the radius of the Earth. And we want to fire our shell so that it gets to a point above the surface of the Earth that is equal to the radius of the Earth. So basically to an altitude that's also equal to the radius of the Earth. Okay. What does the speed need to be? Does the question make sense? Does anyone have any questions? So we're going to use conservation of energy for this. We're going to say work done by non-conservative forces has to be equal to change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. While there will be non-conservative forces used to fire the shell, after the shell leaves the cannon, it has some velocity, and this is what we're trying to figure out. So there's not going to be any non-conservative forces in that case. So we're going to have 0 is equal to uh, 
change in kinetic energy is one half m times its final velocity squared minus its initial velocity squared. And then for change of potential energy due to gravity now, before we would just use something like this, right? We can't do this anymore. That doesn't work because the acceleration due to gravity is not going to be constant over this region. You can only use this when the acceleration due to gravity is constant, when g is a constant, and g is not going to be constant as it moves between here and here. So change in potential energy is going to be negative. So we'll do plus. Um, this is going to be negative g m m over r final minus negative g m m over r initial. And we need to plug all the things in. M is going to be the mass of the Earth. Little m is going to be the mass of our object. Um, there's going to be m's in every term, so that's going to end up canceling. So we don't need to worry about that. What we do need to worry about is what our final, what our initial, and what v final are. So let's talk about that. This is the final position right here. It said find the minimum muzzle speed needed to shoot a shell straight up to a height above the Earth's equal to the Earth's radius. If it's the minimum shell speed down here, then this is going to have to have a final velocity of zero. As far as the radii go, the r here means the distance to the center of the planet. So the initial radius, r initial, or ri, is going to be equal to the radius of the Earth. And the final, what's the final going to be in this case? What's r final going to be? two times the radius R. of the Earth, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so basically all we need to do then is to take these numbers, plug them in this equation here, and solve for the initial velocity. So this is zero, so we're gonna end up getting, let me add the velocity squared to the left-hand side. So we get V naught squared divided by two squared is gonna be equal to, I'm gonna factor out the GME from both of these terms right here. We'll factor the negative sign out too, because that's going to be something else that we need to deal with. So GME comes out. It's multiplied by 1 over R final was 2RE minus R initial, which is RE. Whoops, just RE. And we just want to solve this. So what we get is... Let's see, a half minus one is negative one half times a negative sign. So we're gonna get G M E, I think over two R E. We work out that. But we have a two that we need to multiply to the right hand side here. So we end up getting V naught squared is equal to this, or that V naught squared is equal to the square root of G times M E divided by R E. I think. Let me look at the math. Let's see. So 1 half minus 1 is negative a half, which will cancel out with this negative sign. So we get a half. There's an re in both terms. And I multiplied the 2 over here. The 2's cancel. So we get this. Okay, so we can calculate this. This is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared over kilograms squared. Multiply times the mass of the Earth, which is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Divide by the radius of the Earth, which is uh, 6.4 times 10 to the 6th meters. This uh, square root sign goes over the whole thing, so I'll fix that. And um, get rid of the squared. So we end up getting V initial is equal to whatever that is. Can you all calculate that for me? Calculate it and then put an answer in the chat.
7,900. That's what I got to. Page. If you're not uh, getting these answers right, in fact, I'm just going to stop for a moment here and allow everyone to try to catch up. I got 7,908 meters per second, which is about 7.9 kilometers per second, which is really fast. 